Tonight, we are going to have a discussion, a talk, and then a discussion. Um, we are actually going to read a Jataka tale. And this was presented um, in a discussion, uh, an international discussion. And uh, I think it's really a wonderful opportunity for us to take a look at what's being talked about in this Jataka tale. This is the Maha Dhamma Pala Jataka. So let's start by opening this way. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I am going to bring this, uh, this document up on, uh, for you to see on screen. And I will send it to you. You all need to kind of raise your hands at the end. Let me know that you would like to um, have it sent to you. And I will send it out to you um, after the session is over, okay? So this uh, is a story that sort of explains itself. It is found in book number 10, the Dasanipata. It is Jataka tale number 447, Mahadama. Pala Jataka. This was originally translated back in 1895 when a group of linguists were heavily involved in translations at that time. The English was pretty mixed up and hard to understand. So what we did was we took this and we simplified it so it's easier for anyone to understand uh, the way it is written now. So I'm going to go through it for you and you can just listen and then we will talk about what this is uh, and what we're looking for is when you hear the story you think about what it's about and you see for yourself if this can be applied in today's life and would have the same effect that's what we're wanting to think about here in a way this is a form of engaged buddhism Listen closely. What custom is it, etc.? The master has told us that this is a story about the king, Suddhodana, his father's refusal to believe his son was dead. The story came to the Buddha after his first visit back to Kapalapura while he was lodged in his father's banyan grove. It was in that very spot his father in another time refused to believe the same story you are about to hear during a previous life of the Buddha. At that time, they say that the great king Suddhodana, having given a meal of rice gruel as his own dwelling in the Buddha, to the Buddha and the head of 20,000 brethren or monks during the meal. He talked pleasantly to him saying this, Sir, at the time of your striving, some deities came to me, said the king, and they poised in the air and they said, your son Siddhartha, has died of starvation. And the master replied, did you believe it, great king? Sir, I did not believe it, even when the deities came hovering in the air telling me this, I refused to believe it, saying that there was no death for my son until he had obtained Buddhahood at the foot of a bow tree. And 
The master then said, great king, long ago in the time of the great Dhammapala, a world famed teacher had once come here and said, your son is dead. These are his bones. At that time, you refused to believe this story also. And you said to that teacher, in our family, they never die young. So then, why should you believe now? And then his father's request, the master told a tale of long ago, and everyone listened. Now, once upon a time, when Brahmadatta was king of Banaras, there was in the kingdom of Kasi, a village named Dhammapala. And it took that name because of one family named Dhammapala who dwelt there. For all his time, this Brahmin had kept the 10 paths of virtue. And where he dwelt, he was called Dhammapala or the law keeper. And within his household, even the servitors gave alms and observed virtue and kept the holy day. At that time, the Bodhisatta came to life in that household. And to him, they gave the name of Dhammapala Kumara, Dhammapala the Younger, or the Law Keeper. Now, very soon, he came of age, and his father gave him a thousand pieces and sent him to study at Takasila. He went there and he studied with a world-famed teacher, and he became the chief pupil in the company of 500 youths. It was then the eldest son of his teacher died surrounded by his pupils and in the midst of his kith and king all weeping. He spoke of his lad's deeds in life one last time at the cemetery. And then as the teacher stood in the company of kinfolk and all his pupils were weeping and wailing, he noticed that Dhammapala never wept nor wailed. And afterwards, when the 500 youths had returned from the cemetery, they sat down in their teacher's presence and said, Ah, such a fine lad, so good and tender a child, to be cut off in such a young age, parted from father and mother. Dhammapala replied, Tender indeed, as you say. Well, why did he die at a tender age? Tis not right that children of tender age should die. And then they said to him, Why, sir, do you not understand and realize that such persons are but mortal? I know it, but in tender years they do not die. People die when they have grown old. Uh, then aren't all component things transitory and unreal? Transitory they are. This is true. But in the days of youth, most creatures do not die. It is only when they have grown old that they die. Oh, is that the custom of your family? Yes, that is the custom in my family. The lads told this conversation to their teacher, and then he went and sent for Dhammapala. He asked him, is it true, Dhammapala, my son, that in your family people do not die young? Yes, teacher, he said, it is true. On hearing this, the teacher thought, this is most marvelous thing, he says. I will make a journey to his father, and I will ask him about it. And if it is true, I will live according to his rules. And 
So when he had finished all that should be done for his son, after a time of seven or eight days, then he sent for Dhammapala and he said, my son, I am going away from home and while I am away, you are to instruct these pupils. So saying that, he then procured the bones of a wild goat. He washed them and scented them and placed them in a bag. He then took with him a little page boy as he left Takasila in due course of time. Once he arrived at the village, he inquired the way to Mahadamapala's house and he stopped at the door. The first servant of the Brahmin, whomever that was, he saw him coming and he took the sunshade from his hand. Then he took his shoes and took the bag from his servant. The teacher bade them tell the lad's father that here was the teacher of his son Dhammapala, the younger, standing in the doorway. Very good, sir, said the servant, and he summoned the father to come. He quickly came to the threshold and he said, oh, come in, uh, and leading the way into his house, he seated the visitor upon a couch and he did his host's duty by washing his feet and so forth. And when the teacher had eaten some food, they sat down for a kindly talk together. So the teacher said, Brahman, your son, young Dhammapala, while full of wisdom and a perfect master of the three Vedas and the 18 accomplishments, by an unhappy chance, lost his life. All component things are transitory, grieve not for him. But the Brahmin clapped his hands and he laughed loudly. Why do you laugh, Brahmin? asked the other. Because, he said, it is not my son who is dead. It must be some other. No, Brahmin, was the answer. Your son is dead and no other. Look upon his bones and believe. And so saying, he unwrapped the bones. And these are your son's bones, said the Brahmin. A wild goat's bones, perhaps, quoth the other, or a dog's, but my son is not dead. In our family for seven generations, no such thing has been as a death in tender years. And you are speaking a falsehood. And then they all clapped their hands and laughed aloud. The teacher, when he beheld this wonderful thing, was much pleased. And he said, Brahmin, this custom in your family line cannot be without a cause that those young do not die. Why then is it that you do not die young? And he asked his question, by repeating the first stanza, what custom is it, or what holy way, by what good deed is this fruit, I pray? Tell me, O Brahmin, what the reason is. Why in your line do the young never die? Please say. Then the Brahmin explained what virtues had such result that in his family, no one died young. And he repeated the following stanzas. We walk in uprightness. We speak no lies. All foul and wicked sins are kept far away. We do not, we do not, we, we do deny all things that are evil. And therefore in youth, not one among us dies. Now we hear the deeds of the foolish and the wise of what the foolish do not heed. We firmly do. The wise we follow 
and the fools we forsake. Therefore, in youth, not one among us dies. In gifts beforehand, our contentment lies. Even while giving, we are well content, and having given, we do not repent. And therefore, in youth, no one among us dies. Priests, Brahmins, wayfarers, we satisfy. Beggars and mendicants and all who have need. We give them drink and hungry folk we feed. Therefore, the young among us do not die. Wedded to others, wives do not cry. And we are faithful to the marriage vows and faithful are our wives. And therefore, the young among us do not die. The children that spring from these true wives are wise abundantly, bred to good learning, versed in the Vedas and all perfected. Therefore, none of us die while being young. Each tries to do right for the sake of heaven. So lives the father and so lives the mother. So son and daughter, sister so and brother, and therefore not one of us in our youth dies. For the sake of heaven, our servants do apply their lives to goodness, men and maidens with no sides. Retainers, servitors, each the meanest thrall that works upon the land, therefore the young among us do not die. And by the last two stanzas, he declared, the goodness of those who walk in righteousness saves him when in this way he is bent. When you practice righteousness very well, this brings happiness to those who practice it still. And all that do righteously are blessed by this boon. The righteous do not come into punishment and swoon. Righteousness as a shade saves the righteous. They are saved in the time of rains. Thus the lad still lives. Goodness to Dhammapala such safety gives. Some other's bones are these that you have conveyed. On hearing this, the teacher replied, A happy journey is this journey of mine, fruitful, not without fruit, he said. And then full of happiness, he begged the pardon of Dhammapala's father, and he added, I came hither and brought with me these wild goat's bones on purpose to try to fool you. Your son is safe and he is well. I pray you impart to me your rules for preserving life. And then Dhammapala's father wrote the rules upon a leaf. And after tarrying in that place for some few days, the teacher returned to Kakasila, and having instructed Dhammapala in all branches of skill and learning, he dismissed him with a great troop of followers. Now, when the master had thus given us this story to the great King Suddhodana, he declared the truce and identified the birth. Now at the conclusion of the truce, at that moment, the king became established in the fruit of the third path. And the Buddha explained, at that time, you see, mother and father were the Maharaja's kin. The teacher was Sariputta. The retinue was the Buddha's retinue. And I myself was the younger Dhammapala. So this is the story
and the question that comes up for discussion. Is, does this same thing apply today? It's always fascinating how I get this open again. I love it every time I close down something. Let's see. Hmm. I'm not sure how we do this. There we go. I got you out back now. Okay. So here's the thing we ask ourselves. Does this apply? How does it work? Does it still apply today? And could it apply to people and save them from younger people in the family from passing away, from dying? The only account I can tell you that I thought was very impressed with when I was in um, over in um, um, in Malaysia. There was a small book that I picked up once at a temple, and it was written by a Malay Chinese woman and a family. And the family had always been very, very, very happy. And the name of the book that she wrote was just wonderful piece of bridge work, what I call bridge work, between Buddhism and any other group that is talking about anything. She said, basically, if you want to get to heaven, be good. So this comes back to the precepts and what is happening in our lives with precepts. When we look at lust and greed, the problems we face, hatred and aversion. When we look at sloth and torpor, when we look at restlessness, we look at doubts in our life, these all bring on stress. And tension and stress turns out in modern medicine to be at the core of many of our problems with dis-ease of the body and dis-ease of the mind. Today, they say this in research, they, they talk about this in modern medicine. What was happening from a very young age, the example was there for the children. The example was there for the adults. The example was there through their teenage years. The example of living in a way which was in line with the precepts, in an excellent way in line with the precepts. And when we look at the verses in this, we see the echoing in the, this Jataka tale of many of the suttas that we have practiced and learned about in Twim. Even in the very beginning, it starts how to give gifts. You remember Bhante teaching us about how we should get gifts. We think in our mind with loving kindness first beforehand our contentment lies in our mind and while we are purchasing the gift and wrapping the gift we are happy and feeling good about giving the gift while giving it we are well content it says having given we do not repent afterwards that we maybe shouldn't have done that or maybe i should have gotten something we we let it go into the past now, that's a good point, too, because I think well, everything is he's speaking about when an event happens in the present time, we keep that in the present time. And we don't carry it with us into the next present time and belabor feelings that happened in the morning about something later on in the day because it would cause stress and unhappiness to us. Same way we don't worry about the future all the time. And so we don't have stress 
and we don't have tension rising as a result of moving everything into the future. Another thing they did was they practiced, all the members of the family practiced giving merit, gaining merit by helping those who were helping other people. The priests, the Brahmins, the wayfarers, but even the beggars and mendicants, other monks from different types of groups and all who have need, they were given drink if they needed it, food if they were hungry and shelter for the night if it was possible. All these things were happening within this family and the children and the people in the family were witnessing the support of each other by everyone agreeing to do this, to relieving a lot of stress. Then the stability comes in the home and the marriage is noted that the traditional is respected and that wives remain faithful, husbands remain faithful and not break their vows. And then that is established as a tradition in the family. Again, this is saving the children and the adults from the stress, of agonies, of separation, divorce, everything that was happening. We see that today too, in the same way. So all these things are still applicable, still apply. Then it says each one, even those that are working there, the father, the mother, the daughter, the sister, the brothers, and the son and daughter, the sister and the brother, all being kind to each other. Thinking kindness first in action, forgiving. That's why, you know, it's an interesting thing. We talk about metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka. And we say they are going to eliminate thoughts of ill will, thoughts of cruelty, any discontent. And finally, they are going to bring on equanimity and balance. There will be no more aversion. So they were practicing the Brahma Viharas in function in life. And they were reaping the rewards of this by not carrying things in to the future, which happened. Now let's, let's look at this a minute and also remember that when we're talking about the uh, past, the future and the present, we don't mean necessarily only past lives in another time. We, we don't mean that. We also mean that the past can be, you carry something to lunchtime that happened in the morning, or you're holding on to some event at work when you come home at night. This is the past the immediate past within the 24 hour period. And the other thing is, is about the future. We find people say to me sometimes, well, you cannot say we shouldn't think about the future at all. And I say, I didn't say that. I said that your present time can be when you sit down and agree, you will talk about your son or daughter's next five years through college and what they're thinking about as an occupation. Not everything is locked in stone, but you spend time planning in the present time. Then you put that away and you go back to life and move forward. You always try to move forward. You don't fall back into the mud, get stuck in the mud, spinning your wheels in the mud, feeling regret or sadness or anger or grudge in the mud. I always talk about the mud because when we lived on the mountain, we had these Jeeps and trucks and things and no fun getting stuck in the mud, <laughs> no fun at all. And then having to figure out a way to get word up top, somebody has to come down, push or pull the other vehicle out, no fun, no fun. And there was a lot of rain the two years or three years that we were there. We look at the 
fact that even the people who were working at this man's house, the man in his family, were treated justly, were treated fairly in the positions that they were in, in kind ways. Now, when I look at this whole thing and I say, okay, we practice the Brahma Viharas when we practice twim. Why? Because they're the one that is the this this is the block of practice that is moving to actually change the personality of a person. The breathing meditation calms the person down right away. Don't, by the way, toss it out and throw it away. If you're not practicing it, you can still use it at the beginning to sit down and get very calm and then go in directly to the directions or to the metta, karuna, mudita, wherever you are. You can still use it at the doorway. You become advanced meditators when you have gone to the level where you are practicing with other people. You start by practicing twim. How? You start by sending it to yourself. You're sending it to yourself so that you can fill your tank up and have something to send to someone else. That's how this works. Think about it. Can I give you loving kindness sincerely? Can I send you a wish sincerely and meaningfully if I have none for myself? If I do not have that, how can I give that to you? We used to talk about it in terms of simply having a diamond in your hand. I can give you that diamond, but if I don't have it in my hand, how can I give it to you? It's empty. Yeah, it's empty. So the way we look at this is important uh, to understand that everything we do in a home, it has reverberations. It has, it has a lot of um, frequency floating in the house. Your thoughts produce frequency. Your words produce frequency. The wholesome things have a high frequency and the Unwholesome things have a low frequency and they, sh they don't, don't last, but they low frequency on the bottom, bo on the body. If we send a sound toward the body, lower frequency makes the person feel sick, feel down, even get ill. Higher frequency as we raise it up can bring them to a level of energy, can bring their mind up lighter and more open, more able to have space to stop the reactions, to bring forth responses. Now, when we look at countries, I know I, I listened, we were in a group talking about this just um, yesterday, early, early in the morning yesterday. And in talking about it, we sort of ran away from the text. We came back to the text, but in the beginning, we ran away from the text and said, you know, well, um, America, United States has good programs for people to support them and to try to help people here and there. And Canada has this and UK has this and different places have this. And why do countries have these kinds of programs? Is it only to help the people and be happier and last longer? Or is it to help the people work longer and keep the national gross product, the gross national product is GMP for the country up and operational? A lot of it has to do with that. Keep things running as long as you can. Keep production going as long as you can. The other kind is there too, the compassion, loving kindness for your fellow man and everything is there too. But let's be honest, the countries want to function as well as they possibly can and keep everybody producing. It's healthy, very healthy. It's one of the reasons that COVID scares a lot of people is when things are not moving anymore, how things break down and governments are upset because of the lower GMP, which happens immediately. But taking the practice of your twim, your practice, you're asked to carry out 
four steps. To learn how to watch first when an unwholesome mind state comes in your mind and to watch the frequency of that because you don't want that frequency to be inside you. So you recognize and how to identify that more quickly as you develop your practice. The second step is to let go of that frequency. And the third step is always to smile and that helps you raise up the frequency immediately and come back to meditation, which is really and truly probably the most wholesome thing we can do in our life, which is practicing this twin practice until it becomes automatic in our life. They were doing something like this right effort or this effective practice and taking these effective steps of recognizing when something is not quite right and letting go of it. Never mind it. Let it go from your mind. Just never mind it. Then relax, smile, and come back to what you're doing with a higher frequency. And what is one thing that can raise the frequency very, very quickly? In Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, smile. Remember, this is actually an effective application, the smile, which opens the mind slightly, which gives you the spaciousness to decide to see what's essential, what's unessential, what shall I do uniquely now in this situation? What shall I do? Ah, forgive it. Whatever it is, forgive it. Forgive it. Remember where it belongs, past, future, wherever. Is it here? Get to this place. Then what's going on right now, here and now? And can I decide on a wholesome action there? Yeah, that's a practice, ongoing practice. Why it's called a practice? Because we have to practice it. What does neuroscience say about this, about the changing of habitual tendencies for reaction, habitual habits of hanging around low frequency, unwholesome states? What does it say about that? It tells you the way to change it. And the way to change it is through repetitious application, effective application to the mind, effective application in your mind and your body, your, your body, your feelings, your mind, and the thoughts that come up and decisions to then take action as a response. For what reason? For the comfort, compassion and comfort of yourself and everyone around you. You see that? When we practice twin, we're not just taking care of everyone around us. We're taking care of ourselves. If we can remember to put it in a place and just have it repeating as often as possible. This is why we tell you when we're teaching you twin, we are attempting to teach you a practice that you are learning to take into life to do all the time, not just sometimes, but all the time in life. That's what you should be doing. So let's throw it open to the floor. And the dog has many comments. You can probably hear the dog right now, but I don't think anybody's at the door. <laughs> but anyway, let's throw it out on the floor and let, let's see what you think about this. Questions, ideas about it. I, you know, um, Hugh, I think I have to get Kip a minute. I'll be right back, okay? Go, oh, stay there. Stay there. Thank you. 
Okay. Okay, sit down. Sit down. Yeah, sit down. Okay. What's your thoughts? <laughs> Well, I, I was just uh, reflecting as you were going through that, um, and I can't recall any sutta reference where the Buddha says uh, that um, aspects of uh, um, right living have a direct impact on longevity. Certainly have an impact on happiness, certainly have an impact on uh, the happiness of others. Um, and to the sense of well-being and to the impact on meditation but i can't remember a link to longevity um on the basis that life is uncertain and uh and impermanence it isn't an absolute but if you look I, I think what you have to do is I, I can I should get you some suttas and write them down, you know, and you hear the any place you I, let me see something. Let me see. Start by going into the index and going to um, the precepts. And then, and then you look at the some of the suttas just give you the precepts, but then there are certain suttas that give you the the complete um, the complete precepts. You know, we have like a mistake today. We think it's don't kill, don't steal. And then the third one is don't have wrong sexuality. And then we think it's don't lie. And that's it, you see. And then don't drink alcohol. That's We think that's it. Yeah, but there's about three or four just in the Majima Nikaya. And there's lots of others in the Samyutta Nikaya or in Angutra Nikaya. You can probably find that are going to talk about the extension of those, and then it becomes common sense. And one thing about the Buddha is he did give you everything, all right? So when I say that, he's going to give you stuff, for instance, in this case, when you when you break this one down, you, you say all the things that they mention are in many suttas, and then it tells you about happy. Go to the Sigalavada Sutta and examine it. Tell me there's nothing there. That's a good example. The Sigil of Suits is a really good example to tell you to go over there and really, really dissect it step by step. We did some classes on that once. I'm not sure if we did it here or if we did it on Sundays. But when we go to the precepts, and oh, this is this thing. You can't look up precepts in Bhante, in Bhante, um, I'm sorry, in Bhikkhu Bodhi's books. You cannot look up precepts. Always remember that. <laughs> I spent one day trying to look up what said I need to call him on the phone and ask him where it is. There's an old, old word in there now that we use to find it in the index. It begins with a V, <laughs> virtue. You have to look up virtue to find where anything's listed that shows you precepts. And I guess because I was the 60s child, <laughs> I didn't even consider that word, you know, going after going through the, the wild uh, no, years of the 60s and everything but you go to virtue and when you get to virtue you go through each one of those and you look and you tell me does he give you this kind of thing you know does he does he tell you the answers this way or does he show you what's happening and he certainly tells you in in, in 19 isn't it in the beginning we use he starts out by how is it to live what happens if you live in the unwholesome? What happens if you live in the wholesome? So now you use your common sense and you say, okay, we're looking at it there. I think that's 19, isn't it, right? So 19 is what I call the experiment of where he starts out in the very beginning. And he says, before my enlightenment, while I was still an enlightened, unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, let's do a science project. <laughs> And here's the science project. When I look at this thing, he says, let's live for a few weeks in the unwholesome and let's live in a few weeks in the wholesome and see what happens. And then whenever they talk about it in the suttas, whenever they talk about the precepts, they um, insinuate that the person will be happy and life will be easier, et cetera, and so forth. So they're not coming out to say it point blank, but now let's go to uh, when 
we were going, he, somebody was going to all different kinds of actuarial tables and talking to us about, you know, what it says about how old people are getting in different countries and stuff like that. And I thought, where are they going? You know, and then finally they came back to the suttas one by one. Different monks would say different things about suttas. When you come back to the suttas, all throughout the text, it's telling you if you keep your precepts, why should you? You keep your precepts to as an umbrella to keep the hindrances from coming down and getting to you. You see? And so now they talk about it in that way in everyday life. They don't give you a statement like this. But when we go back and we uh, look into the books that talk about you know, there were back in history, the stuff they're digging up now, you find the histories of kings. Try to think about living for 80,000 years. <laughs> you know, I'm having to live for 80,000 years. Now, my, they didn't mention this, but when I look at that archaeologically or anthropologically, I think to myself, where, where the were the length of years different than they are today or something like that? Because obviously the Gregorian calendar wasn't functioning and lunar calendar was still working, but how, how far back does that go? You know, when you start talking about people running up into their hundreds, into the twenties, and they say, if you get past 110, you're just going to keep going. You know, there's, you're just going to keep going until you just drop. They say that. I have a relative that did 103 years, and one thing I mentioned to them was I come from a family where the women in the cemetery in Philadelphia, back way early before the cemetery started, my family, we can track down the two or three lines involved all the way back to 1355. And looking in there, you don't find any women who didn't live at least to 88 years. No one died before 88 years. I don't know. I don't know. So I guess they're fairly good people the way they were involved in merchants and involved in a lot in their churches and involved a lot in helping people and that sort of thing. We found many things in the genealogy. Um, the reason they had happy marriages is very funny. <laughs> you know, the, the three brothers had three ships and they used to go to China and other places in the world and get things and bring them back and sell them uh, in the United States. And then we find out all these children are in these families. You know, and we're thinking, literally, these men took it seriously. You'll have a very happy marriage if you keep them barefoot and pregnant. That's the way the hillbillies talk about it. And they'll be happy as larks. You know, they have their babies, they have their children, you help them to have food and shelter and what they need. But the, the story in this, uh, you know, in the mountains uh, was always to keep the woman barefoot and pregnant, you see. So when these men were, you look in the, they had a Bible and it told you about the, how long it took them to go down to go, go to where they were going on these ships. They had to go around the Horn of Africa. There were no canals for a long time. We forgot there were no canals. So we were measuring it a different way, but it took them a year and a half to get over there and about a half year to come back. And, you know, when they came back, the only way the relationship was going was, I love you. I love you. I love you. And then he leaves and she has another process another child he comes back he enjoys the children and it all happens again so they they weren't together long enough to have arguments and upsets in those marriages is what we decided we read we dug we had letters that were survived in the genealogy library we read letters uh between the women and they were all content in their marriages and stuff and we're trying to figure out what's going on and then we we pinpointed it yeah, <laughs> we pinpointed it. You're not together long enough to have the problems most people have in their marriages. You're going to go again around the Horn of Africa to China and farther and then come back all the way again around there in these ships. You see? So when you go in here, one thing the Buddha does when he's teaching in the suttas, he does leave something to your your mind to figure out for yourself through testing everything, doesn't he? Because he's telling you, you have to learn 
through knowledge and vision. He doesn't want you in his meditation school. He's even in some occasions asked people to leave if they're not practicing in the way that he's laying out. And he's laid out a plan that you have a method of practice where you can observe the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape of all arising phenomena which cause your feelings and how you go into emotions, the dependent origination. He gives you everything. And then he makes it clear. It's basically up to you to choose what? To choose the response instead of falling for the reaction again. Yeah? So you put it all together if you look in modern research, look at what it takes for a person to get to 100. Do some research on that. And you're going to find when I'm talking to you about the stress and, and the, um, the tension, tightness and stress has been pinned down in our society now in most research, the cause of cancer, the cause of heart problems, the cause of digestive problems, the cause of, you know, lung problems, many, many, many different things. And it comes when you go back, and I keep telling you, use an ice cream cone like this and keep going until you get to the bottom. What was the root cause of it? You got too tight. You got too much tension. That translated from here into your face and then from your face into your body, into your heart, into your stomach, disturbing your sleep, disturbing everything. This is how it works. So if these people were balanced, then what we're talking about is reaching a form of, of equanimity. And they, they were not keeping anybody who was not willing to work on the plantation or whatever it was, whether it was a plantation or a big farm or whatever it was. The household was not willing to keep anybody working there unless they were willing to commit to this, which was wise because then it was a tight system and they did that for seven generations. Yeah. So I think he leaves the Buddha. It doesn't, he's not going to tell you everything. Like if you go to 72 is a good example. And, you know, he tells uh, Vacha in this, he tells the Vacha in this um, about why he's not making progress in his meditation. And the reason is because the whole front part of the sutta is talking about other things outside the meditation. And he's just got his mind going all over the place, thinking about the future, thinking about the past, thinking about this and all kinds of things. And the Buddha just lays it out on the line with him. If you're going to learn how to do this trank, this uh, kind of a meditation he's teaching, that you have to understand that it is hard to see and understand, but it is peaceful and sublime, but it's unattainable by reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. We always say the wise is pointing to the dependent origination. So it is hard for you to understand it when you hold another view. When you come to a retreat, you have another view, it's fine when you're investigating Trump, but when you come in the door, leave it outside. <laughs> That's my advice. Leave the other view, accept another teaching, leave it outside, approve of another teaching, leave that thought out of the outside because you're investigating something in a clear, clean way. You want to investigate it as purely as you can. Pursue a different training, leave that training on the porch and follow a different teacher, leave them out and just come and look at what this is and attempt to practice it by itself. Now, how effective was that advice? Well, I'll tell you. Those 18 nuns in Pune who were Catholic nuns who had never had gotten involved in any form of training for meditation. I taught for 10 days and they all ended up advanced meditators even if they didn't go through all the way to experience cessation for the first time, even if they didn't, they even those there was a uh, there was a few that didn't. Most of them did. Okay, so let's see. Nine, there was not ten, ten that did, nine that did, and 
one did it twice, and there were seven who didn't. But the seven who didn't moved from 15 minutes of meditation to like three and four hours of meditation and could talk to me completely clearly about everything they needed to understand. And so we're just like, we if we had them, our remark was, uh, my assistant and I at the end, you know, at least four of them or five of them, I could say one more day and they would have gone off into cessation like that. They would have just fallen. Because how did they do that? How did all of them do that? And how come I didn't have to tell almost any of them, you're doing the steps of the practice the wrong way. You have to do it this way. Don't do it that way. How come that's not on the charts? I went back and looked. I was making up a chart to, to help other teachers examine it the same way so we could compare notes. And in their case, I never had to say, when you were pulled away, what did you do? Because it wasn't an issue. Because they were saying to me, what was happening, and I knew there was no problem at all with it because they were doing it right. And if I asked them what the steps were in my conversation, they always told me precisely what they were. They weren't going to do anything else. They were going to find out what this is. And that's what they did. And that's why they succeeded. It's not a big miracle. Two of them had had a couple of other kinds of retreat, a couple of other retreats on breathing, but no, they understood when you are told to leave something there to examine this. You're a swimming champion. I wanna make you a long distance cyclist. When you get on the bike, I don't wanna hear about swimming. <laughs> you know, if, you're, if you are uh, you know, a um, cyclist, but I want you on the tennis team, when you're practicing tennis, I don't wanna hear about cycling. I only want to hear about tennis. That's all. Then you can become a versatile sports player. But you can't get good at something if you hold on to other ingredients that are in the recipe and you attempt to keep doing it and you're not making progress. The only way to make progress is to take the ingredients that we give you very carefully and only use them and only this comes out to be like only pay attention to the object in the proper way understand what it's for understand what each thing we're asking you to do is for we want you to be able to say it back to us when we're training you that's the ideal way and then we know you are going to um be able to keep going and they did how do i know because i went back 30 days later, asked several questions about their jobs in the, in the convent and what they were doing and what it changed and what was the same and what was happening and the question of, are you still using this? And by the way, we were not teaching them to become Buddhists. We were teaching them to understand the mechanism of deep, long prayer, personal prayer. And we were using it as an experiment to take the Buddhist instructions for what we've learned and figured out and see if we apply this in not a Buddhist way, but in a operational way, what is effective and what is not effective and how will it affect you in life? And that's this example in this, in the, uh, the Jataka tale, when you do all these things and have everyone in the house in agreement that you're working as hard as possible to support each other, to be able to keep doing this. And it's become something everybody's doing together. That's what happened for seven generations, you see. So, so, uh, and the fact that you know, in your question, really, the Buddha isn't going to tell you absolutely everything. What, what's the use of that? I mean, if he told you everything, then you wouldn't have to investigate, would you? <laughs> you know is what I look at that sometimes and say, would you have to investigate if he told you absolutely everything fine, spent time saying the result of this is, but he tells you, he tells you the result in 19. He tells you in the Kalama Sutta, doesn't he? You know what we do with the Kalama Sutta? You remember that? 
Yeah, you go back to the simple translation of Bonte gave of the, um, wait a second, I can, I don't know if I can pull it up or not. But that was what we said in the end, they asked me, uh, you know, what uh, can we do with this? And I said, uh, well, one thing you can understand how, how to apply it, what do you do with this in life? What was said in this? Let's see if we can get that up for a second because it's real easy to find. Um, I have to make you guys small for a second. Okay. Um, yeah, the Kalama Sutta is really good when you don't go through the whole sutta, but you go into this translation that was done by Bhante, okay? And it was done by um, Usulananda, who was his teacher in the States, and he was one of the highest Pali scholars that Myanmar or Burma ever had. He got the highest award of anybody. And the two of them, they they pulled together this. Um, let me see if the simple one is here. Oops, I need to get you over here. That's not good. What's happening here? Huh? Okay. Mm. Okay. Easier way to do this, right? 104, right? Mm. There it is. I got it. Okay. Dun -dun. Okay. All right. Now, I'm not sure what I have to do with you to get back here. Can you see that? I don't think you can see it yet. Let me think how do I do this. Huh? Okay. Now we do um, stop share. There, I take it. Now I want to go back to the share screen and I want to pull up Kalama. Okay, now let's look at this real quick. You, you should be able to see this now. Can you see it? Okay. Can you see it? Not at the moment. Ah, oh, yes, now I can. You can see it? Yes. Okay. Well, the important part of this, it gives you a lot of advice on the top, okay? What the problem in this one was uh, in the Kalama, the, the Kalamas were confused because many people were coming to speak after some monks had visited there and they came to the Buddha and said, how do we know who is correct and who is incorrect? And he laid down the basics of who is correct and who is incorrect, which sort of goes with this, um, it works with this um, Jataka tale that we just looked at. So I'll read it to you. It is unwise to simply believe what one hears because it has been said over and over again for a long time. That's number one. Then it is unwise to follow tradition blindly just because it has been practiced in that way for a long time. That's another thing. It is unwise to listen to and spread rumors or gossip. It is unwise to take anything as being the absolute truth just because it agrees with one's scriptures without practicing to see through direct experience if they are true or not. Okay, it is unwise to foolishly make assumptions without honest investigation to see if they are correct or not. It is unwise to go to mere outward appearance or to be told to hold too tightly onto any view or idea because one is comfortable with it. And then it is unwise to be convinced of anything out of respect and deference to one's spiritual teacher without first practicing and investigating what is being taught. Now these two last paragraphs are the most important. It may be a good idea for all of us to go beyond our own opinions, beliefs, dogmatic thinking. In this way, we can rightly reject anything which, when accepted, practiced, and perfected, leads to more anger, criticism, conceit, frustration, pride, greed, or delusion. 
These unwholesome states of mind are universally condemned and are certainly not beneficial to ourselves or to others. These unskillful ways of acting and thinking are best to be avoided whenever possible. But on the other hand, we can rightly accept anything which when practiced and perfected leads to unconditional love, contentment, and soft wisdom. These things allow us to develop a happy, tranquil, and peaceful mind. Thus, the wise praise all kinds of unconditional love, loving acceptance of the present moment, tranquility, contentment, and gentle wisdom. And they encourage everyone to practice these uplifting qualities as much as possible. So when we look at that, the elements, the things that, the things that were said in that, in the, are similar to what he's talking about, how the family was behaving, isn't it? It's reflecting hmm. a lot of what's going on in the Jataka tale. Now, another reason you might not hear about um, in the way that you're looking for it precisely, there wasn't a scientific community and a medical research center at that time, <laughs> okay? If we go today, and we look at the effects of these things in research on people, we will find lower heart disease, lower gastrointestinal problems, lower cancer, longer lives. That's what we're gonna find. So it's, that's what I mean when I say it's common sense to take the one part and say, if this is what I'm looking for, is it not precisely there? Maybe it is, but it's there in a different form. You see what I'm saying? Okay, because I, I mean, th there are um, stock phrases about these things, uh, various aspects being for uh, uh, your welfare and happiness for a long time. Right, and that's the welfare is your health, and your health is your long life, your health and exercise. And um, sometimes I, 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 just, um, I just wonder at how these people are so strong here. The women are so strong, you know, and they might not live um, as long as we do, but they're so strong because they have the exercise they do just to keep a house, just to be operating a house um, in hand washing and everything and the cleaning and constantly going on and in the cities, especially. Um, and when I'm dealing with, uh, the um, lower classes and I go to many places to see where people live in the last four years and none of them, even if they're underground, two levels under a building in an apartment down there, none of them can get away from the dirt that is here. That is very different than I've ever seen in my life, okay? And there are phrases, if you go to the story of the arrow, do you remember the story about the arrow when he was hit by the arrow and um, and, and the superate, you know, the wound superates, it won't heal and it just keeps getting, keeps going sore and just won't heal naturally. Why? Well, because they don't, they didn't have ways of covering it. There weren't band-aids, there weren't patches, there weren't things like this. They didn't know about germs and stuff like that and everything, but the constant dust in city settings, especially today, with the amount of cement is one of the reasons why there's so much heat here when the heat turns on in those months. I, I've seen it go up to 119 degrees, you see. It's unbearable. It's absolutely unbearable. And people don't move in the middle of the day at all. Like in South America where everybody takes a siesta, well, that's what happens here. Everybody socializes from 10 p.m. to a 12 midnight. Usually you come out, you walk around, you buy your vegetables off carts, talk to people, talk to the neighbors, see what's going on between 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock at night, including the children. Everybody goes out at that time to buy things together as a family, socialize and stuff like that. It's a, it's a whole different world here. 
but the amount of um, problems they have with water, I don't even know how they live as long as they do. Because once a couple of years ago, I got sick from the water. And then I found out the reason where I was, no one was cleaning the purification system. And I assumed they would be changing the uh, the filters. And at one point they said, yeah, once a year. And I'm there, no, no, uh, once every two months on the filter system we have here right now. In two months, there's black gunk in there and we have to get it out and put a new filter. And they, they now say, when you get a filtration system, do it at least once every three months. But then people can't afford to do it. They can't afford to buy the extra equipment and stuff like that. So, and many people are, are growing up just fine on the water I got sick on. Uh, and it's, it's, not, um, it's not unusual for a Western to come in and my system just wouldn't take it. And I got very exhausted when I, when I left and went to South Korea for about six and a half weeks or so. Um, I had fresh air. <laughs> And I, um, everything cleaned out, you know, and I was, uh, I had fresh air and that's all I needed was clean air. It's, it's, it's a suffering situation in India, but it's not like that everywhere outside in the country. If you go up in the mountains, higher up in the mountains and you can stay there for a base, that's okay. And sometimes if you go away from towns and cities, and you're set back away from a road where there's any trucks going and stuff, then you can have clearer air. But uh, it's something that I didn't have a lot of control over. So I went where I was needed, you see. So yeah, so do we have any other questions about this, about how you would look at this in relationship to what you know about your training about the Buddha, anybody? Does it make sense for you? Okay, so we're going to have some surprises. We have a retreat that's going to run from the 19th this month to the 29th. And then so I will probably still make it for you fine um, in, in the uh, evening time to give you a talk. Uh, not sure where we're going to go with Wednesday nights. Um, we were essentially... Uh, I think we were essentially talking about the, the Buddha, weren't we? The different people in the Buddha's, uh, that was here, that was Wednesday nights. And one thing we can do, but I didn't hear from any of you, I asked you all to just drop me a note or send me, send me an email. And the email is very, very easy. It's Kanti Kema 2. You can actually, well, no, I want you to do this. Kanti Kema 2. I can write it down here, right? Right right here. Yeah, it's um, no, it's not going to write. Well, that's understandable. I mean, you know, it's not being nice to me today. Okay, here we go. Let me see. <laughs> this is funny. Uh, it's not, it's not going to write. Okay, I'm going to have to stop this. Okay. Uh, it's Kanti, K-H-A-N-T-I-K-H-E-M-A. Kanti came a two, like a two, just a two. Kanti came a two at gmail.com. Write me, and the thing I asked you specifically about, I asked you guys whether you were interested in going into uh, the next section of this book, which was talking about what the Buddhist, first of all, was the Buddhist daily routine. And we didn't do that tonight because I felt like this was really going to take up the time. So we can go back and talk about it's a simple routine, but it tells you exactly what it was doing each day. Okay, and then the second thing we were, I was looking at was it goes into um, 
talking about a set it starts the section on the dhamma the teaching of the buddha and goes uh, explaining the different parts of the uh, the books we study but we can actually skip that part but i think there's a section on that and there's another way i can take you in another book to get into this too if you don't like this part well, one of the and and one of the things, another choice was the characteristics of Buddhism, and in that part, it has a section about the tolerance in Buddhism and the causal causal laws in terms of happiness and things like that. And this that chapter I remember as being very good, and that chapter does go into certain things about. Uh, um, how he decided to handle things that existed at that time for women for the caste system and other things so you need to let me know though what you would like to do because i'm open to this to helping you with this anyway or we can go back to suttas if you want to go back to suttas we can go back to suttas there's a lot of sutta presentation right now though that's why i i was um and i have a habit of picking this sutta that i did it twice and i had to say no <laughs> the picking the sutta that Bhante was doing that week or 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 delson was doing and we're not coordinated yet <laughs> we're not to coordinated together so i was thinking well i would like to go in a different direction so but it's up to you because this is your place and if you give me some in you know some food i'm i'm or some ingredients here we can make a great big cake okay <laughs> that'll be fun Okay, so let's hold our hands and say our closing prayer, okay? May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours may they long protect the buddha's dispensation sadhu sadhu sadhu